Hello, this is Patrick O'Shaughnessy, and this is the 11th module in the series Statistical Methods for Analyzing Data Obtained in the Lab or Field. And here we're going to discuss the first kind of fundamental type of hypothesis test known as the single sample t-test. If you've been following along, the module map is shown here is now getting a little more sophisticated. In order to understand how to do a single sample t-test, we first need to understand what a statistical test is, you know, what a hypothesis test is. So we need to understand and inform ourselves with the module 10 information, which is dependent, as you see, on modules 6, 7, and 9. So we're building up our knowledge um, and getting to this point where we can finally do a t-test. But this also emphasizes that you should have reviewed module 6, 7, 9, and 10 prior to listening to this module. Okay, let's move on to single sample testing now. Single sample means just what it is, that you are going to take a single sample of, say, 20 observations, and you're going to compare your mean level to some value of interest. And again, it's depending on the experimental objectives, it may be the case that the mean of the sample is to be compared to some constant value. Is it the same? Is it greater than the value? So in the world of environmental science, it's common to say, want to determine whether air or water contains contaminants of sufficient magnitude to have a mean level that exceeds the government standards. So that's very close to the, the example we just did with EPA is wondering about three parts per billion or not, right? So a single sample t-test is used when only a single sample of n observations is taken. And the t-test will help us to have confidence in rejecting the null um, or not. So the, press, the procedure for hypothesis testing you state the appropriate hypothesis, in this case, as a null and an alternative. The mean, again, it's always about the mean, almost always. Uh, the mean is equal to some value k, or it's not equal to some value k. Then you state the test to be used. In this case, I know I need to use a t-test. Uh, you can determine the rejection region for the test statistic. For that, you need to pick an alpha value, 0.05, say. Uh, then you have to know whether or not it's going to be a one or a two-tailed test. That'll become more obvious. In this case, where it's not equal to means, I don't care which way it goes, high or low, it's just not equal. That is a two-tailed test. You're going to find the table value in the t table that sets the boundary of a this rejection region, as it's called. And then you're going to go out, gather your data, and determine a test statistic from that data that you compare to the rejection region. You can see the equation there, which we've seen before. This is the, the T for the sampling distribution, sampling distribution, where in this case, mu is equal to this value K that we're interested in. And then you determine whether the test statistic falls within the rejection region. Okay, so what is this rejection region thing? So first of all, note that the equation transforms the mean of a sample y bar into a t value. It's called the test statistic. It is a numerical transformation, just like taking the log of something. It is taking the y and putting it into what we call the t domain. Why do that? Well, again, it gets back to the idea of, of applying, uh, uh, transforming into a distribution that is always the same, right? That we can make, create tables of. Again, this was addressed in the previous module, where there's an infinite number of potential uh, distributions. But if we can transform them all into one particular type, then it's much, much easier to create uh, and, and to distinguish probabilities under the curve, for example. Okay, so that transformation allows the resulting t value to be applied to a t distribution. Again, that's always has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. All right, 
right? So then the goal is to compare the t-value to the rejection regions. So again, as stated, we're going to choose 0.05. And for a two-sided test, uh, t could be on either side of 0. So you can see that actually then we're going to split that 5% up into tail areas of 2.5% each. And those are what are referred to as the rejection regions. Now we need to know what is that value right there that defines the rejection region above and below that value. Okay, so we're going to move on. So the values of T that establish these edges, as I'm calling them, of the rejection region are determined from the T table. And we'll see that there's an Excel function as well. So here we have our distribution. This is a T distribution. And these edges values are what we're trying to get at, these numbers. Okay, then we're going to compare the table T values with the computed T value or T statistics. Once we have these values, we're, we're all set. So then the, the idea is if the these computed values, the test statistic values, sorry to use two terms for the same thing, are greater than or fall within this rejection region. See the absolute value is greater than whatever that value right, right here in this diagram looks like it's around 1.9, for example. So if we end up with a value of 2, uh, we can reject. That's falling in the rejection region. Okay, so these are the T computed. And we want to see if they are below or above in this case. Okay, so let's let's do an example here to, to hone all this in because this is still probably a little fuzzy. Okay, so now we have an allowable level of benzene is one part per million. Is the sample of benzene different from the standard? I don't care if it's above or below. Is it just different from one? Which is not quite realistic, but that's okay. We're going to go with that. We go out and we have 10 observations in the sample. Step number one, we declare the null and alternative of mu equals one versus mu equals not one per ppm. It's the different from is associated with not equals two. Different from not equals two. Okay, then we st state the test. It's gonna be a single sample t-test. Determine the rejection regions. Okay, for this we need to use a t-table or again, we can get at it through a function, but the table is actually a little more intuitive. So the table just gives the tail areas up on the top and the degrees of freedom along the column here. So with an n of 10 observations, you know, 10 minus one is nine degrees of freedom. We are then in this ninth row right here. We have alpha 0.05, we're tempted to go to the 0.05 column, but because it's a two-sided test and we have it split out, we have to go to the 0.025 column. And so we're going to come down here. And sure enough, the value is 2.262. That is the number that defines that line to start the rejection region. Anything greater than that is going to be rejected. Now, what is that anything? Well, that is the test statistic number. So you go out, conduct your experiment, get your data, and you're going to determine the test statistic. Okay, so we have a Y bar of mean of 1.82, S of 1.75. We plug that into our equation. So you can see what's going on here. T is the difference between the mean and what we think the null, the null value of one. So you can see what we're developing is a T value based on how far away Y bar is from this value of interest. In this case, it's 1.48 ultimately. We have put this, we have put Y bar and this difference into the T world, T domain. Okay, now on our scale down here, you can see 1.48 is sitting here. But the rejection region starts at 2.262. Nope, we cannot reject the null. 
it's not out there. That means that we are not 95% confident that y bar of 1.18 of 1.82 is so large, right, that it, that it uh, falls into this tail area out here and therefore is most likely part of another population. It's a y bar from a different population than one that has a mean of one. If that makes sense. That's what we're trying to do here. We're saying, no, it's larger. 1.82 is much larger than one. It certainly is, but I can't be 95% confident that it's so big it is part of a different population than a population consisting of one and a standard deviation of 1.75. So hopefully that kind of helps understand and pull this all together now as to what's going on and why we have this rejection region. And then we have this test statistic and we're trying to, so we just kind of first set the boundaries uh, hypothetically based on alpha 0.05 and in the sample number and then we go ahead and put y bar in that difference into it to see are we are we far enough away or not so when converted into the t domain the difference between the sample mean and the value one was not large enough to be 95 percent confident that the sample mean was taken from a population with a mean different from a population with a mean of one part per billion. Okay, now we're going to kind of complete the story here by conducting the experiment, gathering the data, and determining this test statistic to compare to the rejection region values. Except this time we're just going to increase the mean and pretend this time that the 10 observations has a mean of 2.35. Same standard deviation, same sample size, so nothing has happened that the t value from the table is still the same. The setup, so to speak, we still have 0.05 for alpha. We still have uh, a degree of freedom of nine. Go to the same column, get the same rejection region values. They haven't changed. The only thing that's going to change now is the t value of the test statistic. This difference is now going to be larger. And sure enough, it does create a larger t value. Now, actually, this that t value is so large that it is larger than the rejection region value of 2.262, therefore reject the null. So this is somewhat surprising, isn't it? That we said, is it different from a population with a mean of one? We have to go up to a population of 2.35 before we can say, I'm 95% confident that yes, I now have a population of measurements that is has a mean that is different from a mean of one. And that's what's being stated here. After converting to the T domain, the difference uh, between the sample mean and the value of one was large enough now to be 95% confident that the sample was taken from a population with a mean different from a population with a mean of one. Okay, now let's just shift this a little bit. And instead of saying different from, I'm going to now ask the question that might be a little more realistic, is a sample of benzene greater than the standard? And truly, it should say, is a mean of the sample greater than the mean of the standard? Because that's what the null and alternative is saying. Is the mean one around one point ppm or is the mean greater than 1 ppm? Again, 10 observations go through the same thing. It's a single sample t-test, except now it's called one-sided. So all of the 5% associated with alpha is on one tail on the, the right side, not on both. So as you can imagine, then the, the only difference here is that we will now be pulling our number from the t-table from the 0.05 column 
all of the 5% is in one side. We're down to, you see it's a smaller number now, which makes sense. We're shifted further to the left because all of the 5% is, is in the one tail area. Okay, now we just have to complete the process here by conducting the experiment, gathering the data, and determine the test statistic. In this case, again, we have 10 observations, and we end up with a mean of 2.05, same standard deviation, and we can compute the test statistic value. This time we get 1.9, and 1.9 is then compared to 1.833, and yes, it is greater, therefore reject the null just barely on the other side because now you see all the five percent is over here that's it's pushed this tail area further to the left so interestingly if you'll remember with a two-sided test this rejection value was at 2.26 so this would not have been rejected if it was a two-sided test, whereas it is rejected with a one-sided test. Therefore, it is easier to reject a one-sided test. So be careful when you state that you are going to use a one-sided test. You have to have very good reason to do it, in a sense, because um, you are potentially kind of putting in your favor, so to speak, uh, to to push it to reject, if that makes sense. Okay, so one more uh, potential you know, concept here. So again, the entire rejection region is on one side, so the rejection limit is closer to zero. Allowed a lower sample mean to be significantly different from one than for a two-sided situation. Okay, now this is time to bring up uh, another way of establishing rejection. Rather than comparing the test statistic to the table value, the rejection region value, and that is called the p-value. So we're going to go back to alpha again. Alpha is the declared significance level of the test. You declare it. I'm going to say alpha is 0.05. You just get to choose that could be 0.01, could be 0.10, but most people choose 0.05, okay. Now let's just, for example, say we have a two-sided t-test and say it's n equals 10. So then we go through the table in order to determine the rejection region, right? And we end up with degrees of freedom of nine at 0.025, and we get our 2.262 that we saw before. All right, let's say we just go through the motions of gathering data, and we end up with a test statistic of 3.251. Will you reject? Yes, you definitely will. 3.251 is much greater than 2.262, so reject. But you might think to yourself, uh, wow, 3.250 is much bigger than 2.262. I might have been able to reject even with a lower alpha value than 0.05. Say, okay, let's go through this again and pretend and, and lower the alpha value just to see what happens. What if we had used alpha equals 0.01? Okay, in that case, we go ahead and compute or get the table value. In this case, it's going to be in the 0 0.005 column, and it's equal to 3.250. And the 3.251 we got is slightly bigger than 3.250. So yes, we would have rejected even at the alpha 0.01 or 99% confidence level. But you could say ostensibly it's, it's very similar to, uh, to that. So you could go through this process for each one, but instead of that, maybe it's just easier to find out what is the tail area on the far side of your test statistic, not the rejection region. We know that's established. It's either, it's gonna be 0.025, right, for a two-tailed test. What is it after a T of 3.251? Right. 
as as an example and if that tail area is less than the tail area that you say is good enough to reject then you will reject that makes sense and we'll, we'll see a description of this okay so again from the table for nine degrees of freedom and 3.251 is very close to a tail probability of 0 0.005 as we just saw above there okay so it's 3.249 so real close here of and that would tell me that oh we could have rejected at a confidence level pretty close to alpha equals 0.01 but that's true but the more important point is that's much smaller than the declared alpha of 0.05 that's where we started if it's smaller it's got a smaller tail area it's further out than we need it to be out into the tail area so 0.01 now is what's called the observed significance level and otherwise they call it the p-value okay so you compute a p-value and compare it to alpha we just did it kind of manually by looking at the table However, uh, thanks to software, that'll do it for us. It'll report the p-value. So once we have a p-value in our hand, we reject the null if this p-value, which again, think of it as a little tail area, and is that tail area less than the tail area of alpha? If it is, then we're obviously in the rejection region, therefore reject. So this is a little confusing to folks the first time they see this because I, all before this was, is the test statistic greater than the number associated with the rejection region? Therefore, it's in the tail, it's in the rejection region. Here, we're talking about the tail area left behind. So it has to be less than alpha, less than, less than. Okay. Back to the one sample t-test, Excel does not have a predefined function to perform one sample t-tests. However, it does have a function to compute the t-value for the rejection regions. So again, you can go through this manually yourself uh, in order to find out, instead of using a t-table, you can use the t-inverse.2t function for the two-sided test or the t-inverse.t for the one-sided test. In both cases, you put in 0.05. The 2t tells um, Excel to look down the 0.025 column. The dot t, it just looks down the 0.05 column. Now we're gonna, while we're here on one sample testing, the there is another way of going at this, which is the idea of what are called confidence intervals. So a confidence interval also provides you with this concept of 95% confidence, but it indicates the range of values about the mean in which a certain probability or confidence is expected. And it does so in the same units. You don't convert back into the T world, so to speak, T domain. It maintains itself in the units that you're dealing with. So you can end up with a mean plus or minus certain values that establish a range in which uh, you are confident that the true mean of the population resides within. So the confidence interval is associated with the t value, but the interval remains in the units of the measurements. And here is the formula for it. It looks very similar, doesn't it? It's kind of an inverted form of the test statistic equation where we kind of y bar plus or minus our t value times that standard error okay another example let's say we have again results from 10 observations and we uh, have a mean of 2.35 and a standard deviation of 1.75 again and then we choose alpha 0.05 and from that using the function we end up with 2.262 just as we would expect and we've seen this before okay now we apply the equation the confidence interval both numbers high and low are 2.35 
plus the 2.262 of the t value we just got. 1.75, that's standard deviation, divided by the square root of 10. Now, another way to think about this is it's sometimes a little confusing, this plus or minus, but it's really two equations in one is what's going on here. So you could think of it as an upper confidence interval is 2.35 plus, and then there's a lower confidence interval that you're also computing, which is obviously the 2.35 minus. So you're getting two numbers out of this equation. Okay, so it's 2.35 plus or minus 1.252, which gives us a confidence interval range, or the lower confidence interval is 1.1, and the upper confidence is 3.60. Now, what can we do with this? Hmm, if we're interested in, this is a confidence, so to speak, of our, our confidence of where the true mean resides. And we're saying that it's most likely, 95% confident, that it's between 1.1 and 3.6. So if we're interested in this limit of 1 ppm, you could say this is exactly the same as rejecting the null and saying, I am 95% confident the sample is taken from a population mean different from the 1 ppm. It is. See, 1 ppm is not bound. It's less than the lower confidence interval. So it is not within this range, therefore we are beyond it. Now it is a two-sided test, so I have to say different from, um, but that's it, to be technical about it. So that's how you use a confidence interval. And you can see the numbers, 1.10, that's in PPM, 3.6 PPM. Uh, so it's, it's a little easier to get the idea across uh, with a one sample test using this approach.